introduction. It's great to be to be back. I think it's about one year, just about a year since we were last here presenting the solutions uh, to the bottlenecks that we saw then. Uh, I think we've we've learned a lot uh, as a community in the last 12 months. I'm hoping that there will be uh, a lot of interesting new uh, data ideas, concepts, tools uh, that, that might be available to to the ever-growing RNA community. Um, I think the interpretation of bottlenecks uh, is depends on the point of view. I will be focusing uh, from the point of view of purity, scalability of purification. Purity is key uh, as far as as far as we're concerned for for all um, uh, sorts of reasons. And we're chromatographers. Behind me are some of our favorite tools, uh, chromatographic monoliths, which I'll show the use of from the point of view of RNA. Uh, the clicker works. So let's uh, let's consider first of all a little bit about uh, the challenges that we see from the point of view of mRNA uh, drug substance. I'll be speaking exclusively about mRNA drug substance today. Uh, some of the some of this is probably known. Some of this might be might be um, perhaps unexpected. Uh, first, first consideration um, that I think we often overlook is just how large mRNA is as a, as a molecule. If we consider IgGs as large, well, currently circulating COVID vaccines are approximately 10 times uh, the size in, in uh, if measured by Dalton. So 1.3 mega Dalton for a 4,000 nucleotide mRNA, that's pretty big. And we're discussing more and more self-amplifying well, that goes way over three uh, three mega Dalton. So these are exceedingly, extraordinarily large molecules that uh, that bring with it a whole host of of um, of processing challenges. Uh, they are shear sensitive. Uh, we know from uh, from the news, let's say that, and and uh, the previous speaker also touched upon this. The stability is an issue, and we need we need a stable cold chain. Um, and then there, there are processing challenges, uh, partly coming from from the stability, partly coming from from uh, shear sensitivity, partly coming from the uh, the large size of this. And of course, as as is common to any uh, biological, there are contaminants that come that we come that we can introduce in the process or that are product related. So I'll try to I'll try to address um, most of these as as we go through. Uh, it's not all. Uh, we can we can turn some of the challenges to our, to a benefit. So uh, mRNA is large, okay, uh, but there are tools that can that can tackle uh, this size. And in fact, that when the size becomes uh, to an extent an advantage, um, there mRNA is highly charged. I think this this is this we all agree on. Uh, negatively charged that can be taken as a as a advantage. Um, because of the the basis, there's a there's a strong hydrophobic component to mRNA, which we can use to our benefit for purification, and of course, and this is this is I think one of the fascinating uh, areas of development. There are some very useful sequence attributes. Um, I'll focus mostly on the poly adenine tail from the point of view of purification, but um, I think the the sequence. Uh, the sequence design that's that's ongoing for other purposes within mRNA is really quite fantastic. So uh, let's take let's take these qualities uh, into um, the next step. So perhaps this this is this is something that we tackle less, but it's uh, equally important. So what are the key attributes in the final mRNA drug substance? Well, we know uh, mRNA needs to be five prime five prime capped uh, correctly for um, for correct um, expression in vivo, it's got to have the polyadenine tail uh, to be to be stable, and in between is is the magic, the coding sequence. Uh, so, ideally, whenever we we make the RNA, we need to make it with these attributes. And as we make it, uh, I alluded to this, we introduce a whole host of uh, potential contaminants if mRNA is produced um, from a plasmid that we also uh, that we also produce in fermentation and in purify. Then there's a whole host of E. coli contaminants that we need to worry about uh, from E. coli genomic DNA, RNA, E. coli 
um, host cell proteins and importantly endotoxins, uh, then we use a lot of enzymes in the process. So there'll be, there'll be impurities actually stemming from the enzymes. And uh, we try in as far as possible to avoid the use of enzymes um, uh, at the point of producing RNA. We believe that it's also possible to, to do certain things uh, that are typically performed with, with an enzyme uh, just by purification, by chromatography, for example, removal of proteins and, um, and template DNA from the IVT mixture that can also be performed chromatographically, not necessarily introducing a, an enzyme uh, and, and uh, contaminants coming from it. Then we have, of course, uh, the process impurities, DNA template, as alluded to, that needs to be removed uh, from the mRNA drug substance. All of the enzymes from the IVT need to be removed. Um, and if that wasn't enough, well, then there's all of the sequence variants, um, double strands, RNA, any aggregates, fragments, and so forth. So it's a, it's a complicated business, but uh, as, as many companies have shown successfully, it's possible to do it uh, in a very short amount of time, which has been, I think, one of the, one of the huge successes of, of, of the field. When we look at the, at the drug substance production workflow, there we know there are many, many options out there. Uh, all of these attributes um, can be used in, in different ways. Um, traditional purification technology has been precipitation, and I'll address precipitation and the challenges that, that come with it later on. Uh, we know that there, there are very useful tangential flow filtration solutions to isolating RNA um, but we believe strongly that the technology that that is really selective, scalable, and and um, and retains, let's say, high stability in, uh, of the product is chromatography. And so I'll talk a little bit more about what sort of chromatography is particularly useful um, for mRNA. Uh, and in this slide, I show how chromatography is integrated in the process. Uh, so if uh, if let's say if, if we design the whole the whole production process in house, then we want to grow E. coli cells that express the plasmid, harvest the cells, um, and isolate the plasmid from them, which is typically performed with alkaline lysis of cells and uh, precipitation of RNA by calcium chloride um, and buffer exchange before we capture the uh, the DNA. The DNA can be then further purified before linearization. Uh, there's a, there's actually a point of debate I think out there on what's the what are the specifications for purity of super cold uh, plasmid uh, prior to linearization. I would uh, uh, hoping that at least some of the talks in the conference will address this uh, question. Uh, and there are tools to purify uh, plasmids to let's say over 95% super cold purity um, if that if that will be the requirement. Um, we then linearize the enzyme based on the based on the sequence uh, using a whole host of different different uh, restriction enzymes. We then need to remove the enzymes that we put into the reaction and purify out the, the linearized uh, plasmid by by hydrophobic interaction chromatography. Um, we we typically use here butyl column perform buffer exchange, and there we have our plasmid linear plasmid, which we can put into an IVT reaction. We'll talk about uh, some of the solutions for IVT and how to monitor it, how to make it better, how to, um, how to increase the yield, but, but uh, keep some of the key, the key quality parameters intact. And then we need to purify the mRNA. Most commonly used tools here are, um, let's say, affinity purification that's targeting the poly A tail, but uh, not not every IVT is performed with uh, polyadenylation. Um, so we need to have solutions out there also for strategies that do not contain encoded poly A tail. So that our IVT produces non-polyadenylated mRNA uh, that we still need to capture out of the IVT. And we'll, we'll uh, see an example of that later. After we performed the purification, we need to adjust the buffer conditions with typically with TFF, and then perform final filtration um, to produce our mRNA drug substance. As uh, there are many useful tools uh, for each 
of these process steps that are available within within the Sartorius family, which uh, which is not a um, the focus of this talk, but should anybody be interested in any of these individual steps, feel free to, to reach out. Um, my colleagues will be delighted to hear from you. So, uh, I, I alluded to chromatography, I alluded to the properties of the mRNA being exceedingly large, but having a useful uh, physical chemical attributes like charge, hydrophobicity, or, or um, poly A tail. And the first point, uh, that's pertinent here is that due to its very large size, the diffusion of these molecules is exceedingly slow. So it's actually very, very hard for the molecule to diffuse from, from point A to point B in a chromatographic system. So we need to carry the mRNA through a purification system through a chromatographic column with flow. Uh, so we need, we, need to, uh, we need to avoid any dependence on diffusion and we need to, we need to really make use of what we call um, convective mass transfer. That means that traditional rules of chromatography slightly break down or break down uh, significantly, let's say. Um, and so the, if we were performing uh, porous particle-based purification for small proteins, even for IgGs, uh, which we saw earlier, um, there we can still rely on diffusion to diffuse uh, the uh, the proteins, let's say, into into the into the pores of, of these particles, but with mRNA, this will not work. First of all, as mentioned, the fusion will be too slow. Second, the pores that are engineered into these porous particles are simply too small, so we, we don't actually make any use of the of the binding surface. Uh, instead, the let's say the the opposite approach. Um, which for small proteins perhaps wasn't so advantageous is now hugely advantageous for, for such large biomolecules. Um, so monoliths, uh, chromatographic devices, which have engineered pores running through this structure that are, that are between one micron and up to six micron can be, can be designed uh, to desire. Those, are, those uh, do not rely in any way on diffusion, but rather on convective mass transfer, meaning we, we bring the molecule of interest to the column with the flow. It binds to the surface of the column that's, uh, that's modified accordingly to the property that we want to make use of, be it charge, be it hydrophobicity, be it, be it uh, poly A tail. And then by changing the, the buffer conditions, we, we again uh, disassociate uh, um, the molecule from the from the wall, and so that that is then both uh, a much gentler purification because because of the convective flow, there is no turbulent um, f uh, flow created in in the structure. So so the environment is very low shear environment, so we don't tear apart our sensitive molecules. Um, the purification uh, uh, for 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 physical chemical reasons is actually flow rate independent. So actually we can run these purifications very fast. And um, because the, the, the channels are large enough to accommodate uh, mRNA, the, the binding capacity tends to be uh, quite high. So a lot of, a lot of benefits to using, to using such, um, such materials for purification and for analytics. And actually the first the first um, slides that I want to share with you on now how to use these tools to remove some of the bottlenecks in mRNA production will indeed be analytical, which I think are very, very useful. So if we take this chromatographic um, device, monolith, and immobilize it to contain uh, what we call multimodal anion exchange hydrogen bonding um, ligand chemistry, which we call Prima-S, then this Prima S has, uh, has very high selectivity for mRNA uh, over plasmid, over um, individual nucleotides, and over, it turns out, um, also the capping reagent. So we can, we can use this uh, column chemistry to differentiate between our NTPs, capping reagent, plasmid, and mRNA, and you can see how they could be quite useful. Because the chromatography with monoliths is flow rate independent, we can make this uh, chromatographic run relatively short. Um, and you can see where this is 
going. So uh, as an analytical tool, I think this is one of the one of the the best solutions to tracking an IVT reaction. So uh, I show on the left an example of a typical chromatogram. In this case, uh, it utilized, uh, or actually, we, this was a standard uh, injection of standards. So we we used ARCA, uh, we tested CleanCap, AG, um, all of the NTPs, plasmid and mRNA, and they all uh, get separated apart from to the sharp eye, CTP and UTP uh, in the current method coelute. But in principle, we can separate all of the key components of an IVT and uh, signals are nicely scalable. So uh, from that point onwards, I, I would like the community to unleash the creativity and uh, I, I will show two examples of how we see this being useful to, to optimize an IVT reaction. Um, and of course, each company has their own strategy. So I can really only, only um, let's say, uh, tickle the imagination here. So if you just run a very standard um, IVT protocol, like you would download from a, let's say, supplier, of a, supplier uh, website, then you can expect to see something like this. So if you if you use the analytical uh, CMAC Prima S, you can track the reaction every in principle at any time point. The readout time is like we saw three minutes. Um, so if you use one system in principle, you could run analysis every three minutes and see and have your um, your your reaction profiled very frequently. You can track how your mRNA is going. Uh, is increasing how your NTPs are decreasing. So you can say, okay, clearly in this reaction, ATP was the limiting factor. Once the ATP was consumed, the reaction stopped. And you can design the next iteration um, really with, with a view on what's going on in the reaction. So, so this avoids all of the pitfalls of end of endpoint um, analytics that you would typically perform with, with ribogreen or so. Well, uh, that's one way of using it. And uh, we're very pleased to see that a lot of companies are now introducing this at the point of IVT production. So they install a HPLC system and we actually offer uh, something called Pathfix system, which has all of the methods integrated. So you bring your Pathfix system into production suite and you can track the progress of your IVT. And we, we believe it's very useful and we're pleased to see the, the uptake um, in, 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 in the biopharma industry. And so, we want to take it up a notch. Uh, so, what what can you do now you, with the with such a tool? You can you can quantify mRNA very easily, very rapidly. Well, you can then selectively degrade parts of mRNA that that you're either interested or not interested in using selective enzymes. So, for example, you can measure your uh, capping efficiency if you use an enzyme that degrades um, uncapped mRNA. And so we use here a mixture of uh, polyphosphatase and terminator exonuclease, which will degrade anything, any mRNA that's not capped. And if we compare this to a no enzyme control, then we can actually calculate the percent of capping um, of our mRNA from, from the reaction. So let's combine these two concepts and uh, we get this. The, the, we performed... Um, a standard IVT where we listen to the advice of uh, if you want to produce a capped uh, ARCA capped mRNA, you've got to keep your ratio four to one GTP to, to ARCA. So if you did that, um, well, you would pretty rapidly consume GTP and reaction would stop uh, and your yield would be relatively low. Um, I think we, we got here something like uh, three milligrams uh, per milliliter, um, but we then incorporated uh, the knowledge of okay, so we can we can feed this reaction with more GTP, but we need to keep the the ratio constant. So how do we do that? Well, we need to look at the reaction at, at specific time points and feed the right the right sort of mixture into the reaction. Uh, a feeding the re the other NTPs and keeping the the GTP to ARCA. Uh, in, in a constant ratio, and you can do this manually, or you can uh, you can automate this using, for example, an amber amber um, bioreactor system. You can then do, in principle, continuous flow. But this would be your readout. 
And so what we saw, um, and I hope this is clear on your screen that it is on mine, essentially when we uh, we combined now the monitoring of the IVT reaction with capping efficiency determination, we saw that when we don't put any capping reagent in, well, we don't get any capping, so that uh, sort of negative control works. Um, when we do fat batch, but don't worry about the GTP to ARCA ratio, we get uh, nice productivity uh, over 10 mg per mil, but the capping was was pretty miserable, 30, uh, 30 or 40%. Um, when we just are interested in productivity um, of the reaction, so we just feed without worrying about the the GTP to ARCA ratio, we get excellent productivity. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, so, so we get good productivity and, and poor capping ratio. Um, and when we only focus on the, on the capping and not on productivity, well, we get excellent capping 80%, but low yield. And, but as, as the graph on the top left shows, if we correctly both feed and uh, and worry about the capping, the capping ratio, then we combine both. So we get uh, over just under 12 mg per mil productivity and 80% capping. But again, we 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 try to develop tools, not necessarily processes. So I invite you to think about how how else you could you could use this uh, technology. And in the interest of time, I'd like to move on. Uh, so we've now produced a lot of mRNA. We need to purify it out. If it's polyadenylated, um, then I will not spend any time on oligo-DT as, as a highly selective, highly scalable purification tool. Uh, if it's not, then we need to combine, we need to find a different solution. Well, Prima-S, as, as I've shown it now analytically, can also be used for, for purification. So this is a... This is uh, uh, an example of purification of the same molecule. This was EGFP purified by oligo DT on once uh, on the top, and by Prima S at the bottom. Uh, there are many advantages to Prima S. Uh, one of them that it's got really quite high capacity. It's not limited to polyadenylated mRNA, but can be used for polyadenylated uh, mRNA as well. And the purity that we get out is, as you can see from the gels, comparable. So we're looking at the far right gels, and uh, the the lane one before last is is uh, the flow through concentrated flow through. So we can see that we purify out the, the plasmid quite nicely. Uh, you can then combine purification and analytics, and you can use oligo-DT for purification and for analytics and same for Prima S and you can gather uh, orthogonal piece of information, uh, but I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, in the interest of time, there might be questions about double strand. This is the slide that addresses that. So are there solutions to purification or analytics of double strand? Yes, uh, as is well established in the community reverse phase works excellently. So here I have a, an example uh, for purification and or analytics of, of double strands. So we see that the main peak that we call single-stranded RNA is nicely separated from what we call non-single-stranded RNA, and this is verified by dot blot. But in the remaining uh, time that I've got, I want to address a couple of, uh, a couple of um, findings that we've had uh, somewhat, yeah, they were, they were, we were pleased to see them. Uh, we're still working to fully understand them uh, and and it comes to the effect of stabilization of the molecule drug substance mRNA um, depending on the purification route that we take. So what we've done is we've taken uh, let's say the historical approach of precipitating mRNA and compared it to purification uh, by oligo DT as a as a, also a standard tool. We took the aluids. Um, and we put them on at various stability time points. Now, this was not GMP stability study. This was an R&D stability. Uh, and we were looking at, over time, with, with a variety of, of methods, what will happen to one or the other. Uh, the methods were taken from the toolbox that I've largely described, so agros, bioanalyzer, and the various HPLC methods, like uh, we used oligo-DT to, to look for let's say intact polyadenylated mRNA, we also used Prima-S. And uh, this, is the, this is the key slide. So what we saw is that if you precipitate mRNA using traditional uh, 
techno uh, techniques uh, and put the RNA at slightly elevated temperature. We, we put it 37, we could have chosen a different uh, temperature point. Quite rapidly, we saw a significant decrease in uh, in uh, instability, or in, in, in we saw a significant fragmentation uh, after after 28 days or 37 degrees. The, there was practically no material left uh, that was purified uh, by precipitation, but um, there's a lot of gentler purification by oligodity monolith that was that was stable to and and intact to I think 80 percent or so. Uh, we then faced uh, a challenge. Well, this was a small molecule, EGFP, 1,000 nucleotides. Uh, what about, you know, something that's uh, closer in size to to a COVID vaccine? So we took a, another model molecule there, uh, which is 4.4 kilobases, and we actually saw the same. We saw the same. Um, so if purified by oligo-DT, the material was stable. In this case, we ran a two-week study because uh, we were in a rush, uh, but at 37 degree, oligo DT purified material was stable and precipitated material was degraded. Uh, we are often approached by by teams who perform precipitation and then want to perform oligo DT um, purification. And my advice would be, oligo DT does all of the jobs that the precipitation would do, but does it better and more gently. So I would advise to avoid precipitation altogether. And then I want to finish off uh, in the last two minutes that I've got left uh, on the alternative purification approach. So what if your construct is not polydenylated uh, coming out of IVT um, or if for whatever reason you want to avoid uh, oligo -DT? Well, then we would recommend using Prima S as a capture method. And uh, we, some of you may already know that Prima S is a um, anion exchanging hydrogen bonding column depends on pH for elution, and we sometimes face some some questions about about uh, exposing the mRNA to to the pH that's necessary for elution for the primase, which is uh, ten point six. So we've we've performed the purification and again put the material on stability, um, and we show I think quite clearly that um, under conditions in which even precipitation would, would, would destroy mRNA, uh, Prima S purification doesn't. Granted, there was a neutralization step, so as, as, as the purification progresses, pH elution happens, um, pH gradient reaches 10.6, mRNA elutes, we collect it into neutralizing buffer. And that is sufficient for, um, for preserving the intactness of the molecule, even if incubated at this elevated temperature, 37 degrees for up to a month. But we were interested, what happens if you did leave a, a mRNA exposed to 10.6 for any appreciable amount of time? Well, actually it turns out uh, it would degrade pretty quickly. So the neutralization step is really is really key, um, bringing, so uh, in other words, an excursion into the high pH is not dangerous uh, in any way to the mRNA uh, structure. If you were to leave it at, uh, at, at uh, pH 10.6 and high temperature, that is, uh, it would slowly degrade. And what we're also curious to know, and I don't show the slides, uh, the red data here is, if you, inc if you leave the mRNA in the fridge, pH 11 doesn't actually touch it, which was a, a, an interesting surprise to us. So uh, there's a lot still to be learned about the physical chemical properties of mRNA. It's a wonderful um, molecule. I hope I've shared some insights about what, how we see it, what solutions we, we would like to provide to the community. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions, though I'm afraid the time is probably running out, so you can reach me. Uh, on my email or otherwise, and I'll be very happy to engage in discussion. Thank you so much, and have a good conference. Um, yes, thank, thanks, Rock, and, and, and uh, very interesting presentation, very technical, very helpful. Um, as you said, it's probably not much time for questions, but there's one um, a question from the audience. What do you mean by precipitation? Is it lithium chloride? Is it ethanol salt? Is, is it uh, ethanol salt? Yeah, ethanol salt. Ethanol salt. So you, you, 
Okay, you are uh, using S S node sort there, and I I would have a question regarding what what you did with respect to improved capping. So you did a fat batch, but you you not only feed a GTP, which I kind of would have expected, but also the other nucleotides. So what was the reason for for also feeding the other nucleotides? Well, we were trying to. The idea was to and and but. By doing it manually, uh, there's you get a little bit of variation there. But the idea was to keep the to keep the NTP levels constant. So by our idea is it, as you keep the levels constant, the productivity should just keep going. Um, it doesn't quite keep going. There there seems to be a limit to um, to productivity that's somewhere in the range of 10 to 12 mg per mil. Um, but as, as yeah. That's the, that's the reason for, for keeping for keeping feeding also the other nucleotides. Okay, S thanks, thanks, thanks again, and and we have to move forward for the sake of time. But but uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you.